Praise the Lord for justification. Amen. Thank you for being in church on a Tuesday night. I trust you're already planning to be back tomorrow night. And we will just have a wonderful, wonderful time together. By all means, invite somebody to come with you. Do that and it'll be good. And we'll just expect the Lord to do something in our midst. Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, and open it up to the book of James. James, chapter number one. The book of James, chapter number one. When you find James chapter 1, would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? James chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 12. James 1, verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day that you gave to us today. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you bestow on us that so many times we just take for granted. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here in this place tonight, to open your word and allow your spirit to speak to our hearts. And God, I pray that's exactly what would happen in the next few minutes. And we'll praise you and honor you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, thank you for coming out on, on Tuesday evening to be in the house of God. And I know we have some visitors among us. It's good to see a Brother and Mrs. Carpenter back there. And uh, some of their folks from over in North Ridgeville, good friends for a long time, and wonderful, wonderful folks. And I'm buttering you up real good, brother. So I may need something later. So just remember all the nice things I say about you, okay? James chapter number one. The verses that we just read are interesting verses because they're a progression. They're a progression. And tonight I want to give you one thought, one very simple thought. And I want, you to, I want you to take it home with you. I want you to remember it. I, I want to just burn it right into your mind tonight so that it is the foremost thing in your thought process the rest of the evening. It's a simple, simple thought. But don't be deluded by that. As a Baptist preacher, I reserve the right to take a very simple thought and stretch it way out. So don't think you're getting out fast or anything like that. It's a, it's a simple concept. And, and many folks today just don't understand it. And I just want to make sure that you do. The concept is this. Every path has a destination. And if you walk down the path, you reach the destination. Would you all agree with me? Does that seem simple enough? You, you walk down the path, and if you choose to walk down the path, you ultimately reach the destination that is at the end of that path. Now, that seems simple and it seems obvious, but there are an awful lot of folks who never quite grasp that concept. They just never quite get it. Now, there are doors straight back there in front of me. And if I were to go down here and walk directly toward those doors, I would run into those doors and they would swing open and I would go out into the, out into the foyer and then outside. That's what would happen if I walked down this path. That would happen every time I walk down this path. That is the end, that's the destination of this path. If I walk this way, am I going to make it through those doors? It hasn't gotten hard yet. That was not a trick question. No, if I, if I walk this way, I'm not going to make it through those doors. As a matter of fact, what's going to happen is that I'm going to walk over here, and ultimately, uh, if I keep going, I am going to smack the wall, right? That's what will happen. And every time I walk this way and cease to stop, uh, I will smack that wall. That's the great truth I want you to understand tonight. Every path has a destination, and if you walk down the path, you reach the destination. Now, how about this? 
I know that that's not a good destination down there. And I really, in my heart, I want to go that way. And I want to walk through those doors. And I want to make it out through those doors into the foyer and then outside. And so that's my heart's desire. And it's what I know is best. And it's what I want. So I walk this way. What's going to happen when I get down there? I will smack the wall. You got it. You guys are sharp. How about if I'm here and I've talked to the preacher and the preacher has told me how to get through those doors and I believe him and I agree with him and I even saw it in the Bible that that's how you get through those doors. And so now I know how. So I walk this way. What's going to happen when I get down there? I will smack the wall. You guys are sharp too down here. That's good. How about if... If I want to, and I know how to, and, and I desire to, and, and really, really, it's my intention, it's my motive, and my heart is in the right place, and I walk this way. What's going to happen? I will smack the wall. You're getting it. You're getting it. The only way I'm going to make it through those doors is if I walk down this path. And the only way to keep from smacking the wall is to not walk down that path. Because no matter how many times I try it, no matter what my intentions are, no matter what my thinking is, if I walk down the path, I will reach the destination. I want you to look again in the book of James, chapter number 1, and I want to show you a path right here. Look at verse number 14. It says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see, it starts at a point and it ends at a point. It starts at the point of temptation. The point of temptation right here in the middle of life. And the truth is, there is no escape from temptation. There will always be temptation in your life. Always. You say, well, you know, once I, once I reach a certain point, there will be no more temptation to sin. And some of you youngsters, you think, you know, when I hit 20, that will be the end of temptation in my life. Not so. Well, when I hit 30, that'll do it. No, that won't do it either. When I get to be just, I mean, nearly dead and I hit like 40. <laughs> then certainly no kind of wickedness or sin will even appeal to me at, at 40, surely. But that's not true. You know, it's still not true at 50 and it's still not true at 60 and it's still not true at 70. And if you live to be 80 or 90, oh, some of the temptations may change and some of the desires may change. But there will always be temptation in your life to do that which is displeasing to God. Always. If that is not dealt with, the next step on the path, it goes from temptation to lust. Lust is simply an overwhelming desire for something. An overwhelming desire. And if temptation is not dealt with, it becomes lust. And lust, if it is not dealt with, becomes sin, where you accomplish that thing that tempted you, that you desired. And now you're in the middle of it. And if it is not dealt with at the point of sin, then the next step on the path, the end destination, is death. Do you see it there in your Bible? Temptation, lust, sin, death. That's what's at the end of that path. And that's pretty final, isn't it? Would you agree with me that death is not the best place to handle the issue? Obviously, that's not the place. Now, I know that you're thinking to yourself, well, if I'm saved, then that death is, it's not the second death we looked at last night in the Bible. It's not hell. It's not that. Listen, there's still death at the end of that path. There's still death at the end of that path. A lot of things can die down there. The death of potential to serve God can die down there. The death of your plans and your dreams and, and all relationships and family. There's all kinds of stuff that can die right down there at the end of that path. That's not the best place to deal with it. Sin is not the best place to deal with it. Because sin, although God is merciful, thank God for that. And God can take you from a mess of sin and transform your life. But that's not the best place to deal with it because sin always leaves scars and always has baggage. And some of those scars and some of that baggage you will carry with you through the rest of your natural life and never get away from it. Lust is not the best place to deal with the problem. Because once you begin to lust after something, you are so consumed by it that it's highly unlikely that anybody's going to get you to turn around. That's the nature of lust. 
The best place to deal with the problem so that you never have to smack that wall down there is at the point of temptation. The point of temptation. And if you can deal with it there, then you don't have to worry about smacking the wall and the scars and the baggage of sin and dealing with lust and all the rest. If you can deal with it right here, it'll save you all that grief down there. I want to give you tonight some very, very simple things. Very simple things. Just four steps to overcoming not death, not sin, not lust, but temptation. Because temptation is a thing that we all deal with every single day of our lives. Four very simple things. And I hope you'll, you'll remember them, write them down, take them home, study them, pray about them. See if God will cement them in your heart. And in your mind, number one, you want to keep from smacking that wall. Then the first thing you need to do is guard your eyes. Guard your eyes. In Psalm 101, verse number three, the psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. He simply said, there's something there that's a, a temptation, that's a stumbling block to me. I will not allow it to be in front of me where I can see it. I will not allow myself to be where it is so that it's there to tempt me. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. We travel all the time. We're all over the country. We just got back from California. And one of the things you see an awful lot of out in that part of the country is billboards. Great big billboards. I mean, just huge stuff. Huge billboards. And we were, we were going through uh, areas of Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. And they have big billboards for movies and television programs and and all kinds of Hollywood stuff. And, and I'll just be honest with you, there's stuff on those billboards larger than life that you ought not see and you ought not look at. There's stuff there you shouldn't see, but there's no way to escape it. There it is right there in front of you, larger than life. Can I make a distinction for you tonight? There's a difference between seeing something and looking at it. Say, well, there it is, and so, and so I saw it, and so I had to look at it. No, you didn't. You may have had to have it pass across your field of vision, but you certainly didn't have to stop and look at it. And you definitely didn't have to stop and take a second look at it. That was your choice. That was your choice. The psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Turn there if you would. I don't want you to accuse me of making this up. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 27. Jesus is speaking. He said, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know that passage. You've heard those verses. You've heard that said before. But I want you to look at it tonight and see, see what Jesus said and what Jesus didn't say. You know, sometimes we, we get to a verse like that and we almost flip it upside down and read it backwards. We really do. And so it comes out more like this. I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, that evil woman has caused that poor man to sin. And it comes out that way easily. And I'm going to give you a little preacher secret tonight. Nobody's supposed to know this but preachers, okay? I'm going to tell you why that happens sometimes. Because we're men, it's easier to preach on the woman's sin than it is to preach on ours. So if we can make this her fault... It's more fun to preach on. Then I can preach to you women about how you ought to dress and how you ought to act and all that kind of stuff. And I'm scot-free because it's your fault if I sin. But Jesus didn't say that. He said, if you look and you lust, you have sinned. I want you to notice that he didn't talk to the woman at all. Not at all. He didn't say a thing about appropriateness, and he didn't say a thing about modesty, and he didn't say a thing about not being flirtatious or... He never said a word. He was just talking to men, and he said, If you look and you lust, you have sinned. You see, it's up to you. It's up to you. There will be things all through your life that you see that you shouldn't necessarily see, but you don't have to look. And you can turn away and say, Lord, please help me to clear that out of my thought process and help me not to dwell on that and help me not to think about that. Because if you're not careful... That which was a temptation becomes a lust. And then the next thing you know, it's sin. And you're pretty close to smacking the wall. You better guard your eyes. 
I don't know how it is in the Cleveland area, but I know how it is in Fairbanks, Alaska. If it were to get as warm as it got today in Fairbanks, there would be naked people running all over the place. I'm not kidding you. I mean, all it takes is a little bit of sunshine and some temperatures above freezing, and they're just all over. They're up and down the roads in all various states of undress, and I would imagine that probably happens here when it gets just a little bit warmer. And you're going to see things you shouldn't see. But again, you're going to have to guard your eyes and not look. Job said in Job chapter 31, verse number 1, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I don't know what the situation was. Maybe there was a young lady there in, in Job's neighborhood or area that was inappropriate or immodest or whatever it was. But he said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I've already decided before I ever see it that I'm not looking. And I'm not going to take a second glance and I'm not going to think about it. And I'm not going to dwell on it. You want to guard yourself from temptation and overcome temptation? You had better guard your eyes because the devil will use your eyes. He will use your eyes. And it's not just men. It's women as well. The devil will use your eyes. And he'll get you to, to desire things that you ought not have and lust after those things. And then next thing you know, you're accomplishing those things and you're in sin. And then you're over there smacking that wall. And you don't want to be there. You ladies, you know, you're susceptible to, to different tools of the devil. Have you, ever, have you ever seen the magazine Homes and Gardens? Have you seen that? That's not really the name of the magazine, is it? What's the name of the magazine? Better homes and gardens. Better than what? Well, better than your home and your garden. That's what. <laughs> everything in there is better than everything you've got. Better than everything you will ever have. And you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to entice you to go down and spend a whole bunch of money that you don't have to do something you don't need to do just because you saw something that caught your attention. The next thing you know, you're... You're up to your eyeballs in debt and you can't give to missions like you ought to give to missions. And suddenly you can't tithe anymore because there's not enough money. And you see, the devil uses your eyes in a lot of ways. You better guard your eyes or else you'll find yourself going down that path that you don't want to go down. Guard your eyes. Number two, guard your thoughts. Guard your thoughts. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. It's a familiar passage, one that many of you have memorized. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Guard your thoughts. Now, why would God take the time in his word? To tell us to think on these things. If, if you just be honest and you look at that list, that's pretty common sense stuff. I mean, of course you want to think about things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. That just makes sense. Why would God take up space in his word to tell us that when it just seems like such common, ordinary, good advice? Well, because the God that made your mind and your body knows how your mind works. And God knows that if you don't think about the right things on purpose, you'll think about the wrong things without even trying. Without even trying. Your mind will go places that it ought not go. That's why many times when you preach to young people, you end up preaching about TV and movies and music and books and magazines and all that stuff. You know why? Because all those things put pictures in your mind. All those things put thoughts in your mind. And if you allow your mind to be filled with the wrong thoughts and you think about the wrong things, you're going to find yourself down here on this path. And those things that were a temptation to you, you will begin to desire them and it'll turn into lust and then you will accomplish them. And the next step on the path is sin and then there's death down there at the end of that path. You better be careful. You have to guard your eyes and you have to guard your thoughts. That's why it's so important. The kind of music that you listen to. It really is. And I know there are people who profess to be Christians who listen to every kind of junk under the sun. I know there are. You are hurting yourself. 
So yeah, you, you ought to preach to those teenagers about that rock music and that awful stuff. Listen, you know, that's almost a waste of time nowadays. Really, just to be honest. Because even a lost person with half a brain know that, knows that that's vile and wicked. I mean, the stuff that passes for music today, it should not even be a question for somebody who professes salvation to listen to that kind of filth. I, I'm just telling you the truth. I mean, for me to stand up and preach to you about that is almost ludicrous. I mean, the kind of stuff that is being played on the radios today and listened to by teenagers is so vile and ungodly. I remember when I was a kid, preachers would come through our church and they would read the lyrics of some of the songs that were popular, you know, and they would explain to us what those lyrics meant and we would be shocked and appalled and it was awful. You don't have to explain them anymore. And the sad truth is you can't even read them in public anymore. I could not read to you tonight some of the songs that are being played on the radio right now. I couldn't read them to you in mixed company because they are so vile and vulgar and disgusting. I'm not going to say those words. I wouldn't, I wouldn't read them to you if it was just a group of men here tonight. And for saved people to listen to that stuff and allow it into their mind over and over and over and over. You are literally putting yourself on a path that leads to death. You are destroying yourself. And some of you will say, yeah, yeah, that's awful. And that's horrible. I'm glad I don't listen to that stuff. I just listen to just the good old country music. Well, God bless you. <laughs> it's just as vile and reprobate. And, oh, oh, no, but I have hymns by. Just fill in the blank. There are plenty. The same guys who are out drinking and and boozing it up and, and singing with the whiskey bottle on the stage, have their hymn CD down at the bookstore, and you're such a gullible person that you'll go down and buy it and think somehow that makes it good because it was in the Christian bookstore, shame on you. I'm smiling at you because you can't get mad at me if I smile at you. Yeah. Shame on you. You say, but there, there are two songs on that CD that are just good, wholesome, nice love songs. What about the other ten? Where he's drinking at the bar and where he's cheating on his wife and because they're on the same CD. Well, I don't listen to those. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And you know all the words, Mom and Dad and Grandpa. You know all the words. Boy, it's quiet. You see, the problem with all that stuff is that it puts thoughts in your mind. Thoughts in your mind that a saved person ought not allow in their mind. All of a sudden you hear some guy talking about how he's down drinking and he's cheating on his wife and he met this cute waitress and that cute bartender and this and that and the other thing. Why in the world would you want those pictures in your mind? Because if you fill your mind with that kind of filth, pretty soon that's the kind of stuff you're going to start to desire. And you will lust after that. And you will find a way to accomplish it after, if you lust after it long enough. And the next step on the path is where you smack the wall and there is death down there. There's death down there. Guard your, guard your eyes and guard your thoughts. It's so vitally important to think about things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely. Be careful when you turn on your television. You know, it's, it's kind of shocking. We, I, I, I watch news, basically. I watch news if I'm going to watch something, and my wife likes to watch cooking programs. And every once in a while, we will accidentally run across some kind of sitcom. I remember when I was just young, they were vile then. They were vile then. But again, if you didn't know what they were talking about, you missed it. Today, you don't have to wonder what they're talking about. Because the things they used to hint at 20 years ago and 30 years ago, they just say openly and blatantly now. And Christian families sit and watch and listen and laugh together over filth and wickedness and perversion. Perversion, being made fun of. You know what they're really doing? They're making you accept it. And when you think of it as funny, it's not so vile anymore. And next thing you know, your thinking has been changed because of what you allowed in through your eyes and you allowed pictures to be placed in your mind. 
you'd better be careful. You want to overcome temptation, guard your eyes and guard your thoughts. Here's the third thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13. Guard your feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation. Notice it doesn't say death or lust or sin. It says, will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Guard your eyes and guard your thoughts and guard your feet. What is God saying here? He's saying, don't allow yourself to be where the temptation is. Look at verse number 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry was the sin in question. I would dare say probably here at Cleveland Baptist Church that there's probably not a lot of folks who sneak home after the service and open the closet door and there's a little Buddha sitting in there and you rub his tummy and you leave him cookies. That's, that's probably not what you do. But there's probably some other temptation in your life. And God's prescription for overcoming that is to flee, flee, turn around and run from the temptation. Here's a great truth that some folks miss. The same door that got you in there can get you out of there. No, but I didn't know it was going to be there. Well, then turn around and leave. Because you can't allow yourself to be where it is. Oh, but I'm, I'm a Christian now, so I, I, can, I can handle this. I can be around this thing. No, you can't. No, you can't. You just can't. Uh, one night, a young lady was standing up to give a testimony in my home church. and I was there preaching. And, and we always have testimonies on, on Sunday night. And, and we dim the lights in the auditorium. And then we have these big spotlights. And we turn them on. And it's kind of a deer in the headlights thing. And they get real scared. And... And then they're not sure what to say, and then they don't talk very long. It's a blessing. <laughs> hey, you've got to have some fun in church, you know. So this young lady got up there, and she was talking about how she went to one of the local high schools in town and how she'd gotten saved not too long before. And She said, now, I, I want you folks to pray for me. My friends are always trying to get me to go to these parties I shouldn't go to and smoke this and drink that and do this kind of stuff. And she said, I, I know I shouldn't do that stuff, so please pray for me that, that I'll be strong and I won't do that. And my pastor is a very wise man. He got right up there. She was standing in the pulpit. He walked right up to her and he got right up to the microphone and he looked at her and he said, no, we're not going to pray that for you. I thought, well, that's, that's almost a little rude. You know, all she wants us to do is pray for her. How bad could that be? He said, there's no reason for us to pray for you. But what you need to do is quit hanging around with those people. I thought, wow, that makes sense. That, that's a stroke of genius. You know what she was doing? She was standing right in the middle of the temptation. And then saying, now pray for me that I won't get into this. When God already said, turn around and run from it. So you're already violating the principles of the Word of God and then asking God to overcome your rebellion and, and bless you. It doesn't work that way. But if God said, turn around and run, then you turn around and run. Because if you stay here, it doesn't matter if the whole church is praying for you till they're blue in the face. You're going in if you stand there long enough. You are going in. Don't allow yourself to be where the temptation is. Turn around and run. Maybe, maybe before you got saved, you had a problem with, with alcohol. Then what you need to do is make sure that you don't have a drop of it in your house. And if you have to take a different route home from work to not go past that place you used to stop on the way home, then take a different route home from work. So it will take 15 minutes longer. Better to take 15 minutes longer than to fall back into what you were before, isn't it? I think that's worth an extra 15 minutes. To avoid that and to keep from destroying your life. I talked to a, talked to a woman one night after service and, and she said, I, I was a drunk before I got saved. That's a, that's a good Bible word, by the way, drunkard. Alcoholic kind of makes it sound like it's somebody else's fault. Or it just mysteriously happened to you. It doesn't mysteriously happen. It happens because you drink booze, amen? That's how it happens. So you're a drunkard, according to the Bible. That's a Bible word. I like Bible words. It's a good Bible word. 
She said, before I got saved, I was a drunk. And when I got saved, she said, God just miraculously took it away. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't always. And it's a wonderful blessing when it does. I mean, she said the desire for it was gone. She said, I wanted to, I wanted to reach my friends for, for Jesus. And that's good. That's a good evidence that you got something when you want to tell somebody else about it. She said, so I started going to the bars and clubs with them. So that's not a good idea. She said, no, it wasn't a good idea. She said, first, first all I drank was, you know, I'd have Coke or something like that while they drank. And then after a while, I'd have just a little beer or just a little wine. And before too long, she said, I was a drunk again. And I probably shouldn't have, but I asked her a question. I said, did any of those friends get saved? He said, no, they didn't. You know what the devil did? The devil convinced her that since she was saved now, she was strong enough to be around that thing that had so strongly controlled her life. And she wasn't, and you're not, and I'm not, and nobody else is. Listen, if the Lord has freed you from something, you just stay away, as far away as you can stay. Oh, but if I, if I go to my family's house at Christmas, there will be some of that there, and I don't want to hurt their feelings. Listen, better to hurt their feelings than to lose your testimony in front of them. You don't want them going to hell because they thought you were another hypocrite who didn't really have anything, do you? I wouldn't want that. Listen, you need to guard your feet. Guard your feet. Number four is the last one. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Isn't that a wonderful verse? That's number four. Guard your priorities. Guard your priorities. If you don't guard your eyes and guard your thoughts and guard your feet and guard your priorities, you're going to get on a path because we all face temptation. You're going to get on a path where that temptation, if it's not dealt with, becomes lust. And that lust, if it's not dealt with, becomes sin. And that sin, if it's not dealt with, becomes death at the end of that path. Guard your priorities. You better be careful. Priority number one ought to be the things of God. How can I please God? How can I honor God? How can I serve God? Can I tell you priority number one is not sports? It's not. Not even if the Super Bowl happens to fall during church time. Listen, if you skip, if you skip church for the Super Bowl, you got messed up priorities. <laughs> messed up. I'm smiling at you again. We had a lot of young people at the at church there in Fairbanks, and and there's a there's a disease that that overtakes them in the summer. You know they'll show up for church at 50 below zero, they will, I and mean, we will have a full house at 50 below zero. There's nothing else to do. They'll come. I mean they'll show up, and we had triple services on Sunday morning. It'd be 30, 40 below zero. They'll show up at eight o'clock Sunday morning. Sometimes they would be that they'd just stay for all three services because their heat didn't work at the house, so they'd stay at the church. They'd be there till one o'clock on Sunday afternoon and then come back at, at six for church again and, and almost proud of themselves for showing up no matter what at church until summer comes. And then all of a sudden spring comes and that disease takes hold. I don't know what they call it around here, but in Fairbanks we call it softball. It's a disease. <laughs> And it takes hold of them. And all of a sudden, those good, faithful people are putting their kids in softball in the summer. And somewhere in heaven is written the, the great law that all softball games must be played on Wednesday night. And if there's a tournament, it goes over the weekend and you got to miss Sunday because you got to be there for the tournament. I don't know where it's written, but it's up there someplace. And those people who are so proud of themselves for showing up every service in the cold and the treacherous weather, they'll miss half the summer every Wednesday night and the occasional Sunday. And they'll have this glazed look in their eye and say, but my children have to play softball. If they don't play softball, they won't be well-rounded adults. They'll be socially stunted. And you can, you, can, you can gripe at them all you want, and they're playing softball. 
And then the kids get to be teenagers. And the parents come back to you. And they're all distraught. They say, Johnny and Susie don't want to come to church. They want to go do this and go do that. And we've always been in church and they know better. And you smile at them. They're only doing what they've been taught. And what they've been taught is not that the things of God are the most important. What they've been taught is that the things of God are important as long as we don't have something we'd rather do. The problem is later on, they're going to have a whole lot of things they'd rather do. And then it won't just be what mom and dad thought they'd rather do. It'll be what they think as well. And if you're not careful, you will lose them altogether. And you can blame the Sunday school teacher, you can blame the youth leader, or you can blame the Christian school, or you can blame the pastor. But you're wrong. You're wrong. They're only following the example that's already been set by mom and dad. You'd better guard your priorities. Because if your priorities get out of whack, mom and dad, trust me, your kids are going to have them way further out of whack than you did. Way further. And the things that you allowed and made excuses for, they'll find a dozen more things to allow and make excuses for. You better be careful. Guard your priorities. Sports is not priority number one. Fun is not priority number one. It's shocking how many folks miss church, you know, because after all, it's a sunny weekend and you have to go to the lake or you have to go here or you have to go there. After all, you spent so many thousands of dollars on the toys, you've got to use them sometime. Priorities. You better guard your priorities. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Young people, listen very closely. Priority number one is not boyfriends and girlfriends. Yeah, amen. It's not. I know, I know how, I know how young ladies are, you know. You get to be about 19 and you look around and all your friends are getting married. And you think, oh no, I'm an old maid and there's no hope. <laughs> really, that's how, that's how young ladies think. We, men, men don't quite think that way. We can, we can last a whole lot longer than that. You know, we, don't, we don't think in those terms. We just don't think that way. But you better be careful. Keep your priorities right. Ladies, can I tell you, there's somebody out there who'd marry you tonight. There really is. If you're willing to dig deep enough, there's a low-down scum out there somewhere <laughs> who would marry you tonight. I'm not lying to you. There's one out there somewhere. There's more than one out there somewhere. You better keep your priorities right. Or you can make decisions now that will ruin the rest of your life. And you'll spend your whole life banging your head against that wall. And that's a miserable way to live. Can I tell you a little secret? It's better to want something you don't have than to have something you don't want. Just think about that for a minute. It's a whole lot better. A whole lot better. You better be careful. I, uh, most of you know, the, when I first started in evangelism, I was single. The first uh, six years on the road, I was single and, and just all by myself in my van. And it was amazing. You know, I, I, learned, I learned a lot of stuff. I learned that there are a lot of single women in churches that go out to eat with the pastor. I don't know why that is, but it seemed like there were unclaimed blessings in every congregation that went out to eat with the pastor. Just for fun, you know, there they'd be. I found it best just to play dumb. Just smile a lot, eat your food, go on about your business. That was the best thing to do. I had, a, I had a woman call me one day. I don't give out my phone number. The only people that have my phone number are preachers that might need to call me and my family. Those are the only people. Not that I, I don't want to talk to people or don't want to hear from them, but I just, I'm not a phone talker. Uh, when, once I've said hello to you and we've discussed the weather, uh, I can listen for a long time, but I don't have anything else to say. I'm just pretty much done. So I, I don't want people calling me because I don't have anything to say to them. 
So a, a woman called me on the phone. She was a secretary from a church in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And, and she called and she said, I'm so-and-so from such-and-such such church. And I'd just been there a couple weeks earlier. I thought, this has got to be the church secretary. And, and she's wanting to find out where to send a love offering or she wants to get the dates when I'm coming back or whatever it is. And, and so I was very polite to her, very cordial. Oh, yes, had a wonderful time there and uh, enjoy the church so much. And she said, I, I have a daughter. So praise God for that. That's nice. <laughs> she's in Bible college. That's, that's so, I'm so glad she's not in the street. I'm glad she's in Bible college. That's a good thing. She said, and I've talked to her, and I believe that God would have you to write to her. And she said it would be okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's a whole different ball game there. I was just shocked and stunned for a minute. She said, I believe it'd be the will of God. Would you please consider writing to her? And so I did the only, only reasonable thing. I said, no, and I hung up. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I said. And that was it. I said, no, and I hung up. That was it. That was all. Crazy woman, obviously a crazy woman. Listen, she didn't know me from the man in the moon. I, I could be an axe murderer Monday through Saturday. All she saw me was one day. She didn't have a clue who I am. And suddenly it's the will of God for me to write to her poor daughter. Listen, ladies, don't do that to your daughters. Don't do that. If they're that desperate, just get them a puppy. <laughs> don't, don't embarrass yourself and then like that. Please don't do that. That's horrible. Horrible. Liz and I, Liz and I were old single people. She was there working in her dad's church, and I went through there and and met her, and and then a year or so later went back through there again and was preaching at the church, and we began to correspond back and forth by email, and and then a couple of years later, I I caught a plane. I was preaching in Mesa, Arizona, on Sunday. It was a building dedication, and then I caught a plane from Phoenix Monday morning out of out of there and flew to Pasco, Washington. Took her out to dinner that night, the fanciest place in town. And I, I had somebody else set it up because I didn't know what was there in town. And they told us it was the fanciest place. It was right on the river. Of course, it was dark and we couldn't even see the river. So I don't know if it was really or not, but it was expensive. So we went. <laughs> and we went out to dinner. And we sat there and we just had a wonderful time. We, I had, we had a flaming dessert. I had never had food on fire before. Now that I'm married, I've had it a couple times. But I'd never had food <laughs> on fire before. I can say that because my wife's not here tonight. <clears throat> It's true, though. <laughs> and then and then after dessert, I whipped the ring out of my pocket and I flipped it out there and I popped the question and she didn't know any better. So she said, yes. <laughs> and so the next morning at six o'clock, I caught a plane out of Pasco and I got out of there. I came, I saw, I conquered, I got out. <laughs> really? I wanted to be there for the proposal. I did not want to be there for the wedding preparation. That's not a man's idea of a good time. You ladies, you live for that. Oh, a wedding. Oh, this is wonderful. We get to plan flowers and dresses and decorate. We don't think that way. We, we don't want to know. We don't care. Just tell us where to stand when it's time. That's all. So she would, she would call me on the phone while she was making preparation. And she'd say, I, I want to do this color for this. And I would say, that's wonderful. That's, I think that'll be beautiful. Let's do that. And she'd say, I want to do this kind of stuff. I said, Wonderful. Beautiful. She said, she called me one day. She said, I want, to have, I want to have birds in the wedding. I said, now, I, I just, I don't think birds. That's just not a good idea. I, I thought she was talking about little cheesy plastic birds sitting on the, I thought, this, this is tacky. We're not going tacky. We're not doing that. She said, no, they're real birds. I said, oh, that's even worse. Real birds, real birds do stuff. You can't have real birds in the auditorium. You, she said, they'll be in cages along the wall. So, okay, okay. Doves in cages along the wall. I'll, I'll do that. That's all right. We can do that. She said, they'll coo while the, while the violins play. I said, beautiful. Doves, I love doves. She had nine attendants. Nine attendants. What that meant in the practical sense is that I had to find nine men who were willing to spend their entire day at a wedding on a Friday 
and dress up in a tuxedo. I am not from Pasco, Washington. I don't know people in Pasco, Washington. So that meant everybody who was going to come, men now who don't want to go to weddings anyway, who were going to show up at the wedding, wear the tuxedo, had to come from other places to come. I had people that flew in from Alaska. We had about 40 people that flew down from Alaska. We had, uh, we had people that flew from Ohio. We had people that flew from California. And they came from uh, Wisconsin. And they came from every place. They came from everywhere. And I got nine guys to show up. I got them to come. But by the way, that's the downside to getting married as old people. She had way too long to think about this wedding. <laughs> you get married at 19 or 20. She's only had a few years to plan. It'll go much more smoothly. She had a lot of years to plan this wedding. They built a ramp that went from here. And her father's church is a large, large church. And, and the ramp went from down there all the way up into the baptistry. The baptistry is about the same size as yours. And they built a castle in the baptistry. A castle. Literally, a castle. And we walked up that ramp. And the choir, we had a choir singing. We had eight violins and six trumpets in the balcony. And uh, trust me, it was a big production. And we're walking up the ramp and we got up to the castle and we lit a candle in the castle. I don't know whose idea that was. The castle was made out of cardboard. We could have built, it's just the whole place could have gone up. Could have gone up in smoke. It, it was amazing. But I told Liz, you know, if, I, if I've got to get nine guys to come stand here, I need some incentive. If I tell them that after the wedding, we can take those doves outside and get shotguns and open the cages and <laughs> blow away the bird. I can get 30 guys to show up. This would be the wedding of the century. She said, no, if we do that, we have to pay for the doves. I said, oh, well, we won't do that. I don't want to pay for the birds. Free birds is okay. Paying for birds, not a good idea. So we did the whole thing. We marched up the thing. And, and then we turned around and we sang to, our, to each other in the choir. Sang and, and I didn't tell my attendant, my, uh, my guys over there, my groomsmen. I didn't tell them they were going to have to sing. I told them right before the wedding. Because I knew that would have been a deal breaker for the whole batch of them. So right before the wedding, they had to memorize a song so they wouldn't look stupid while they were standing up there. It was good. It was good. And they all, we all came down. It, it was exciting. As her father brought her down the aisle there. He handed her off to me down in the front. And I took her. And we walked up there. When I took her hand down there in the front, that was the first time I ever held her hand. It really was. And we went up there and we went through the whole thing. And it went way too long. We had three preachers. That's a mistake. <laughs> they, they all say, oh, I won't take long. Yeah, they, they take long. And when, when the preacher said, you may kiss the bride, that was the first time I'd ever kissed her. It's the first time. I know, I know what some of you are thinking. You know, that's weird. That's just weird. Come on. That's ridiculous stuff. Well, there, there are two good reasons for that. The first one is what the Word of God says. That's the most important. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. That means any woman you're not married to, you just keep your hands off. So, but we're engaged. You're not married. Keep your hands off. You're violating the Word of God. The second good reason is that if you don't start walking down the path, you won't hit the wall at the end. So you just don't ever start walking down the path. We had a wonderful time. I am not a wedding guy. Usually I prefer a good funeral. Uh, honestly, <laughs> it's just so much better. But it was it was a pretty good wedding as weddings go. It was quite the production. That was in July. There was another wedding that was supposed to be in June. Another young lady from the church. She and her husband were were going to teach in the Christian school the next year, and and they were excited about serving the Lord and good good young people that grew up in the church. I'm not talking about people who came in off the street and said, "Can we get married in your auditorium?" I'm talking about young people who grew up in church. They were supposed to get married in June, and it was going to be a big deal, too. I mean, they had all kinds of stuff planned. They found out in, I don't remember if it was March or April, that she was pregnant. And so they didn't have the wedding in June. Instead, they got married in a little private ceremony in the preacher's office with their family there. 
And she was heartbroken. Heartbroken. I can tell you, I can tell you what happened. What happened is that they were just going on about their lives and planning their life and doing just normal things. And, and they found themselves in a place of temptation. And they didn't turn around and run from that place of temptation. And instead, that temptation was allowed to become lust. And then at some point, when all the circumstances were right, that lust became sin. And then that sin became death. And a lot of stuff died that day. The plans and the dreams she'd had since she was a little girl of her big, beautiful wedding and all that went along, that all died right there. It just died. She didn't teach in the Christian school the next year. That died. Neither did her husband. That died right there. Let me tell you what the devil does. He's not satisfied just to have you walk down that path and destroy your life. He's not just satisfied with that. A few months later, I guess it was the first part of June, the end of May, Liz went into the bank where this young lady worked. And they had already gotten married and all that. And, and Liz went in and, and saw her there at the bank and just asked her how she was doing. And she began to cry. She said, my wedding dress came in today. And she just stood there and sobbed at the counter of the bank. You know what the devil does? He convinces you that it's a good idea to walk down the path. And then when you smack into the wall at the end and you destroy your life, then he comes back and he takes you and he rubs your nose in it. And he says, boy, you're stupid. How could you be so stupid? How could you do that? What a, what a foolish person you are. And the rest of your life, he reminds you of what he convinced you to do in the first place. And just keeps bringing it. I mean, long after it's forgiven and God doesn't even remember it anymore, he'll keep reminding you of it over and over and over and over again. Just to torment you and ruin your life. You better keep your priorities straight. Because if your priorities get out of order, you're going to find yourself walking down a path that you never intended to walk. Every path has a destination. I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe you're all the way down here and you're about to smack into this wall. Maybe you're here and you've never trusted Christ as Savior. And you've lived a life of, of self Self, uh, selflessness, selflessness, and, and sin and wickedness. And now here you are down here and, and the next step on your path is death. And that will be eternal destruction. And you'll spend eternity in hell. The good news tonight is even if you're right down here, God loved you and sent his son to die for you. And he can rescue you from that spot and get you all the way back over there. Or maybe you're already saved and you've made some foolish choices and decisions and you are just inches away from smacking into that wall. The good news is God still loves you. There is forgiveness. There is restoration. And God can take a messed up life that is about to smack the wall and bring you right back over here to where you could start to go this way and serve him and honor him. Maybe you're over here and you're just in the point of sin. And there's something tonight that has hold of you. Maybe, maybe nobody else even knows about it, but it's got a hold of you. It's hanging on and it has got its claws in you. And it's just a matter of time until it becomes so severe that everybody will see it down there. Do you know what it is? Thank God our God is a merciful God. And he can rescue you from that spot tonight. There is forgiveness for sin. Or maybe you're over here. And you're at the point of lust. And something has become a temptation and now it's become an all-consuming lust. And your thoughts are full of it and your days and nights are full of it. And you think about it all the time and you're looking for a way to accomplish it. The good news is you don't ever have to go there. You can get out of that spot tonight. Or maybe you're here like we all are every day. And temptation has crossed your path today. And it'll cross your path tomorrow. And it'll do it again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And every single day until you stand in the presence of Christ and you're made just like Him, the temptation will continue. 
The good news is you don't have to go down the path. You can overcome the temptation here. You can guard your eyes and you can guard your thoughts and you can guard your feet and you can guard your priorities and you can have the testimony. Listen closely, especially you young people. You don't ever have to have the testimony that I went over there and destroyed my life and now I'm serving God. That is not the best testimony. The best testimony in all the world is that I'm right here and I never went there and I'm serving God and I'm going to continue to serve God. And you can. And you can. With the help of the Holy Spirit of God in your heart, you can stay right here and never have to go over there. Listen, moms and dads, one of, the, one of the stupidest things I ever heard in all my life came from the parent of a Christian school student. The young man that we were having to expel because he had just done some foolish, wicked things and there was no way we could keep him in the school. And we had his father and his mother sitting there in the office and we were discussing what was about to happen and what we had to do. And, and his dad said, well, I did that stuff when I was his age and I survived. Stupidest thing I've ever heard in all my life. Why in the world would you think it's okay for your child to make some of the same foolish choices you made? Listen, you only survive by the grace of God. He may not survive. She may not survive. You ought to be on your knees every day praying that they never start down the path, but that they stay here and they follow God and serve God. So that they don't have to carry into their lives the scars and baggage that some of you carry every single day. Guard your eyes. Guard your thoughts. Guard your feet. Guard your priorities. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father.